Hey guys, Sar here. Today we're going to try to understand chapters 343 through 347 plus Karapika's backstory, so content warning for descriptions of a massacre in that section. I actually had a ton of fun editing the last Hunter Hunter video, so I hope you don't mind the style where I put a drawing in the background and overlay relevant images on top occasionally since it allows me to keep away the copyright demons while simultaneously allowing me to share some art with you. A lot of times I feel like I only ever get the opportunity to share finished pieces, but sometimes it's fun to record how they're made and see that process as well. Here is your spoiler warning of the video by the way. Full spoilers for the entire series. I will be referencing events which take place both before and after these chapters in this video, so please click off if you care about spoilers from future like manga chapters or anything. Also, I've linked a crash course video which summarizes the entire Hunter x Hunter anime in 45 minutes of quips in the description. It's super funny. So I do recommend watching it even if you have already seen the anime. Major props to the creator. This one is going to be long, so feel free to grab a drink, grab a snack, and then put it on in the background as you do other stuff. We'll start with synopsis and context in chapter 343. With two empty Zodiac seats to fill, Cheadle, the leader of the Zodiacs, invites Leorio to join, stating he's the most respected member of the Hunters Association at the moment. This is because he punched Gon's absentee dad in front of hundreds of people during the election arc, and yeah, that was pretty satisfying. Leorio says he's busy with med school, but Cheadle offers him study abroad credits if he joins the Zodiacs on the voyage as part of the medical team. Cheadle says if money and a safe job on the mainland is all Leorio is after, he's free to refuse, but he accepts. Showing money was never his main motivation, despite claiming contrary early on in the series. As there's still one more empty seat on the Zodiac parliament table, Leorio recommends his friend and our favorite red-eyed sad boy, Karapika for the position. Back in Beyond's expedition team, Lair, Pariston, and Jing continue their de mental sparring match by debating how the Hunter Association will respond to Netero's request for the Zodiacs to race beyond to the Dark Continent. Jing states if Cheadle accepts the V5's job for the Hunter Association to chaperone Beyond, She'll likely recruit extra lower level members through the Hunter exam, which is the association's rigorous membership selection process. He labels this the most realistic outcome, confidently stating that Pariston would probably consider it moderate and boring. Jing then begins to say their late leader Nedra would have taken this route, but Pariston cuts him off immediately with a vehement denial. This is the first time we've seen his fake smile drop since the election arc, his displeased expression showing despite his slimy personality and borderline malicious actions, Pariston still deeply respects Netero. Pariston insists Netero would have refused the V5's job, even if that meant the Hunter Association would lose a major client. He angrily says Netero would have found his own way to the Dark Continent, getting there before Beyond arrived on Kaken's ship, and then he would have announced the Hunter Association would hunt Beyond on the Dark Continent. This is very different from the Zodiac's interpretation of Netero's wish. The Zodiacs think Netero wants them to explore the Dark Continent before Beyond, but Pariston sees taking Beyond out as an integral part of that request. Pariston actually states his proposed course of action is the only truly acceptable course of action, implying his displeasure that the current Hunter Association is so weak they'd rely on outside government powers like the V5 and Kaken for passage. He believes the Hunter Association should continually challenge itself, even if that means creating the challenge, 
by ensuring Beyond meets them free and not taking the easy path to the Dark Continent. Periston sees losing the V5 support as not a valid consideration if it would hinder the challenge, which is a very flippant standpoint to take um, because the Hunter Association employs thousands of people who rely on the association's connections to make money to earn a living. So a lot of people and families depend on jobs that the V5 provide. Jing asks why Periston wants to destroy the Hunter Association if he's so obsessed with it, but Periston doesn't comprehend how the actions he proposed would destroy it. Jing compares Periston to a baby crying for attention, trying to play with the Hunter Association like a playmate because he's bored. Jing theorizes if the Association bored him by taking the easy way out, Ferriston would release his 5,000 Chimera Ant soldiers into the world to cause chaos and force the Association to face a challenge. But if the Association interested Periston by showing backbone and taking the difficult route, Jing hypothesizes Periston would play by sending the ants to take the hunter exam and fill the Association itself with his loyal pawns. From there he could set up no end of interesting games. Periston neither confirms nor denies Jing's theories, but truly no good option for the association if Periston gets to do what he wants. Luckily we have Jing to be his playmate instead and at least delay his ant invasion plans for a while, hopefully. Jing goes on to say Periston and him are similar because they both think in unorthodox ways. Periston agrees they're similar. He believes they're similar because normal people feel happiness when they love and are loved in return, but he feels happiness when people hate him, and in return he feels compelled to hurt the things he loves. Periston then jump scares us with his creepo shadow grin face, asking Jing, is that so strange? Jing says it depends on the extent of the hurting before rebuffing Periston's main point by essentially telling him, Yo, you're spiraling. I meant we're alike because we think about situations differently from most people. Not because we both want to torture our family members. That's a you thing. Don't project your kinks onto me. Which is just so funny. Because Jing essentially set Periston off by pressing his buttons, and then when it worked and Periston started ranting about his love language, Jing went, Whoa man, we're not that close. Other members of Beyond's expedition team who have been forced to awkwardly watch Jing and Periston's hate sex foreplay tell Jing to leave, but Jing intimidates them, causing them to shut up. Jing notices another member of the team, a quiet robot-like girl, watching them and asks if she's the leader when Beyond's away, sensing her strength. Periston, having regained his usual cheery facade, says no, he's number two. Jing deduces the hierarchy of Beyond's team isn't based on strength. Here Jing is referring to both physical strength and their superpowers, or Nen. Essentially, he's implying Periston is a weaker overall fighter than this quiet girl. Periston warns Jing not to underestimate him, but Jing is confident in his assessment. He notes, however, that beating Periston in a fight would be easy, but it wouldn't mean actual victory. To defeat Periston, Jing will have to break his spirit. Making the first move in their game, Jing challenges Periston for his number two position on Beyond's exploration team. Elsewhere, Mizai Stom, the Ox Zodiac, visits Karapika's base in order to invite him to the Zodiacs. The dark-haired receptionist tells him to leave since the boss is out, but Mizai Stom resolves to wait until Karapika gets back. Displaying a patience and steady determination, commonly associated with his animal motif, the ox. Oddly, he also asks for coffee, saying he'll get the milk himself, which, seeing as he wears dairy cow themed clothing, I don't even want to think about the implications of. Karapika's goons try to remove Ms. Eistan by force, despite him mentioning he's a crime hunter, essentially a police detective, so he had the right to be there. So he uses one of his Nen abilities or superpowers to restrain them, 
Mizaistom then sits down to wait patiently and the secretary finally gives in, revealing Karapika was in fact in the building, just that he was in a bad mood, advising the Zodiac not to make him mad before he should walk into the room but the scarlet-eyed dude himself. I mean, Karapika has always looked somber and reserved, but something about seeing him introduced in all black for this arc is just, you know he's in a dark place mentally just by looking at him. Mizaistom greets Karapika and immediately understands the young man is someone who's seen a good amount of death. He tells Karapika Leorio recommended him for Zodiac, inviting him to travel to the Dark Continent with them. Karapika immediately shuts him down with a short, I'm busy, but before he can leave, Mizaistom pulls out the Kurda card, revealing he knows Karapika is trying to recover the scarlet eyes of his murdered clanmates. Karapika immediately snaps at the mere mention of the Scarlet Eyes, and we see that, yeah, he's he's just as unstable, if not more so, than when we saw him last. Mizaistom offers Karapika a deal. If he joins the Zodiacs, he'll give him intel on the owner of the remaining Kurta Eyes, which were scooped out of the corpses of the massacred Kurta clan bodies, preserved in jars, and traded all over the world as collectible art pieces. As a Zodiac, Karapika would be required to join the Hunter Association on the Black Whale One's voyage to the Dark Continent, a journey which would take roughly two months, but the owner of the Eyes would be on board. Karapika accepts immediately and Mizaistom reveals to him the owner of the Eyes is the fourth prince of the Kokin royal family, Saridnik. Just a refresher, the Kokin Empire is the country sponsoring the voyage. The king and majority of the Kakin royal family are going to be on board as a PR stunt of sorts, making the voyage a historical event. Think of the Queen of England and the royal family going on a trip to Mars. The public would read about it in news articles like their celebrities. By joining the Zodiacs, Karapika hopes to confront 4th Prince Sir Nick on board during the voyage and recover the last Kurta eyes. Time for a quick detour to cover Karapika's backstory presented in Volume 0, a short one-shot of events leading up to the Kurta clan massacre. Volume 0, Chapter 1 Deep in the forest, in a hidden village, resides the Kurta clan, a small group of people whose eyes glow red when feeling strong emotions. A young Karapika argues with the village chief to let him explore the outside world, but the elder refuses him in a weary way, implying the same argument takes place almost daily. Overhearing the commotion, older Kurta shake their head, viewing the outside world as full of discrimination and prejudice. The adults consider the Kurta village a paradise and are mostly content to live there without leaving, although adults are allowed permission to leave after passing a readiness test. Meeting up with his friend Pero, Kropika complains how unfair it is, that leaving the forest without permission is considered the greatest sin a Kurta could commit. Pero, a young boy with dark short hair, patiently explains the Kurta people have a unique language and Karapaga hasn't been taught the outside language, so he wouldn't be able to communicate outside the village. Although some outsiders with eyes which don't turn scarlet do live in the village, the Kurta have lived mostly isolated for a long time. Pero applies some medicated eye drops to his eyes, going on to say people in the outside world bully those with differences, so only adults who can keep clan secrets are allowed outside. When Pero looks up, Karapika has run off, not hearing the end of Pero's advice. One year ago, Karapika and Pero discovered an injured girl in the forest. They offered her some water despite not understanding her language and became friends. In return for helping her, the girl, Sheila, gave the boys her well-loved copy of the book Dino Hunter. The Dino Hunter detailed the adventures of hunters. Hunters are elite members of society who can use men or superpowers. With the aid of his dad's dictionary, Karapika translated and the boys conversed with Sheila while her leg healed. The boys hid her from the elders at her request, bringing food to a cave in the forest where she taught them about the outside world. 
Although the healing process took longer than expected due to Sheila falling and re-injuring her leg a bunch of times, one day she vanished, leaving a note for the boys that she hoped they would meet again in the outside world one day when she achieved her dream of becoming a professional hunter. After she left, the boys read the hunter book every day for a year, becoming fluent in the language of the outside and dreaming of adventures. One day, the village chief confiscates the book, seeing Karapika's passion for the outside world when the boy confronts him to get it back. Karapika begs the chief to let him take the readiness test to be allowed to leave the forest, and when the chief gives in, Karapika studies diligently in order to pass. While he studies, his mother and father watch him, discussing the Curtis Pass. While scarlet eye hunting and discrimination was a problem in the past, his mother says it's been peaceful for a hundred years. His father attributes the peace to the Curtis habit of relocating their village every so often to avoid discovery. We also learn past Curta discrimination may have had some religious basis. The phrase, red eyes are the devil's messengers, a common past superstition. Karapika's test consists of three parts. The language and customs slash convention section passed flawlessly. The village chief explains the final section, a self-control exam. Stating a kurta must not allow their eyes to change color in public, the chief presents a bottle of special color-preserving eye drops, developed by their ancestors as a side product of trying to create a color-suppressing compound. The color-preserving formula freezes kurta eyes in the scarlet state for 24 hours if activated. The chief asks Karapika to go on an errand to a nearby town in the outside world and return without his eyes turning scarlet. By administering the eye drops, the elder would know if he got angry and failed because the eye drops would stain his eyes red, and they would still be red when he returned. The chief then asks Karapika to choose a partner for the errand, emphasizing if his partner's eyes turn red, he would fail as well. Instead of one of the presented adults, Karapika chooses Pero. Pero drops the bottle of color-preserving eye drops when handed them by the elder, and after picking them up from under a dresser, the boys apply them and set off for Nuncha City, which is a six-hour giant bird trip from the village. During the trip to the city, Karapika reflects on the importance of him passing the test so he can leave the forest and find a doctor to help Pero, who's been injured since a childhood incident where Karapika got too adventurous and Pero fell from a cliff while trying to save him. The fall injured Pero's eyes and legs while Karapika wasn't hurt, leaving him with lingering guilt, although his friend doesn't blame him for the accident. Volume 0, Chapter 2 While running errands, some punks trip Pero in a department store on purpose and Pero apologizes, saying his eyesight isn't that good. The punks hassle Pero and Karapika further, but Pero urges Karapika to stay calm. The two boys apologize to the punks despite clearly not being at fault, and other customers in the store take their side. The punks leave and other customers help them finish shopping. The punks confront the boys again on the outskirts of town, claiming the boys need to pay a toll to leave. Pero pulls out a cell phone, dialing the police to confirm if there really was a public road toll which spooks the punks into leaving. On the way past, one of the punks notices Pero's lame leg and trips him. Pero brushes it off, but Karapika's anger starts building. When the punk goes on to call Pero a derogatory term due to his physical injury on his way out, Karapika snaps. His eyes turn scarlet and he beats the hell out of the three full-grown men with his bare hands until they start begging for mercy. The punks admit the Kurta village chief had paid them to rile Karapika's partner up. But instead of the expected adult, Karapika had chosen Pero, who was extremely calm and level-headed. Pero tells the punks to call the chief, telling him the punks failed to make the boys angry. The punks comply. Before the boys can leave, however, the department store customers, having seen Karapika's scarlet eyes and fearsome combat skills, confront them. An old woman with a cross on her chest calls them devil's messengers, and a younger woman expresses fear the boys will kill them out of anger. Disheartened by the turn of events, Karapika and Pero head home. On the trip back, Pero reveals the Kurta gain tremendous strength in exchange for rational thinking when they get angry. Basically, they can fight better, but they can't think as clearly. 
Rapika wonders if the Kurta don't belong in the outside world after all, but Pero tells him to consider the incident a lesson. Pero reveals he switched the chief's color preserving eye drops with his own medicated eye drops when he dropped the bottle earlier, meaning Karapika's scarlet eyes fade and the chief won't know he got angry and failed the test. Back in the village, the chief declares Karapika passes, granting him permission to leave. He also gives Karapika a copy of Pero's medical records, revealing he knew that Karapika wanted to leave to find a doctor for his friend. On the day of his departure, Pero reminds Karapika he was inspired to venture outside by adventures shown in the Dino Hunter book, so he wants Karapika to enjoy his travels and have fun, even if he has a mission. I'll ask you, was it fun? When you return, Pero says, encouraging him to have adventures and explore so he can reply with yes in earnest when they meet again. Six weeks later, a female traveler hiking through the woods discovered a massacre. 128 bodies of Kurta men, women, and children, all missing their eyes. A complete bloodbath. Family members had been killed in front of each other gruesomely, with children especially brutalized, so the clan members would feel intense anger, transforming their eyes a valuable scarlet hue which persists after death and is considered one of the most beautiful colors in the world. A preserved set of scarlet eyes fetching top dollar in black market trading scenes. A message assumedly from the perpetrators was found near the slain bodies reading, We'll accept anything you leave, but don't ever take anything from us. This exact sentence is the infamous catchphrase of Meteor City, an impoverished wasteland fill inhabited by extremely protective dregs of society. During the York New Arc, in Volume 11, we see the exact same message left by the elder Meteor City after he avenged a resident's wrongful conviction by mass bombing 31 people involved in the resident's case. Essentially, when residents of Meteor City are wronged, the entire city has a history of seeking vengeance in gruesome, disproportionate ways, perhaps giving us some clue to the motive behind the Kurta massacre. Though, the targeting of valuable body parts in particular may indicate a stickier web of interlaced motives. Chapter 344 in the basement of his office, Karapika stares at a shrine of recovered Kurta eyes in jars despondently. He reflects on all the people who have owned the eyes, people ranging from swindlers to teachers to doctors. He also remembers the lengths he's gone through to recover the eyes over the years. He's threatened, coaxed, paid people off, changing his strategy with each situation. He says, I've lost something every time I got back a part of my brethren. This line of dialogue is one of my favorite and most devastating lines from Karapika. After not seeing him for so long, we're happy he's gathered so many eyes, made progress toward his goal of putting his people to rest. But then, with just this one line, we realize this progress hasn't been healthy for him. Though he's closer to achieving his goal, he seems more unhappy than ever. Staring at a picture of Tsurai Nick, Rapika says the Kakin Prince owns the last remaining Scarlet Eye sets, Peros among them. Once he recovers the final eyes, Rapika says his journey may finally begin. Begin! Mm, pain, pain, misery, pain. He wonders where he would go. Karapika sits in front of the shrine of flowers and religious motifs he's constructed, darkness all around him, and his sagging shoulders tell us all we need to know. He believes there is no home for him to return to, nobody left to welcome him back. Karapika sits in front of the memorial altar and says, I have nothing left. Back in Beyond Space, the Arrested Explorers team members tell Jing, Periston brings order and a plan, asking what he could offer if they accepted him as acting leader while Beyond's absent instead. Jing starts by offering to pay each member double what Beyond offered them up front instead of upon completion of the job. The former Boar Zodiac says the team can keep taking orders from Periston 
Jing only wants to be the official designation of number two on the team. The other members are confused, asking what would even be the point of the title if Jing didn't want them to follow his orders, but one of the team members steps forward, accepting Jing as number two in return for the massive cash transfer offered. As soon as the deposit hits his account, the member excuses himself. Other members believe he took the money and ran, but Jing seems unfazed. He asks if anyone else will take the deal as Periston stares at his ass. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's actually no other explanation for this panel, honestly. Moving on, another crew member accepts Jing as number two but declines his money. Jing tells him to take it and donate it to a charity if he really doesn't want it. Periston smiles, saying it would be great if Jing was number two seemingly conceding his position easily. Jing grins, guessing correctly that Periston didn't accept any money from beyond. Meaning Periston's not earning any money from the voyage, unlike the other members of the team, Periston just joined purely for the kicks. Leorio scolds Karapika over the phone for not picking up his calls and demands his email so they can stay in touch. Karapika, feeding his self-isolating tendencies, refuses. Hanging up as Mazaistam, the Ox Zodiac warns Karapika to handle the Sarai Nick eye recovery situation delicately once on board due to the complex political situations. Since the V5 hired the Hunter Association to keep peace on the voyage, and the V5 are now partnered with Kaken in the V6, if Karapika, a member of the Hunter Association and now a Zodiac, loses his cool and attacks Sarai Nick, it could be seen as a V5 sponsored assassination attempt on the Kaken royal family, a mistake like that could end the V5 Kaken allyship, shattering the delicately rebalanced world power distribution. Karapika tells him not to worry, but Mizaistam is unconvinced, likely doing a quick risk analysis since he said two words, scarlet eyes, earlier and Karapika just about ripped his head off. Back in Beyond's base, Jing gives teammates a crash course Dark Continent lesson, revealing more information about the mysterious place. First, the five calamities weren't accidentally brought back, but the Gatekeeper's Guide forced those who returned to bring them back as a lesson to humanity. A price and a warning to greedy explorers. So basically, each time explorers return alive, in return for guiding them back, the Gatekeeper's Guide often turn survivors into plague carriers for calamities. Jing states, I and Pap have already wrecked havoc on the known world and the remaining calamities are locked in the Red Tape Agency's bunker. Sure hope 5,000 Chimera Ants don't attack the facility and let loose the plagues or anything. When asked what benefits the dangerous trip could provide, Jing lists five natural resources, each one miraculous but closely guarded by its respective calamity. I'll put the details of each natural resource associated trip sponsor, respective calamity, and survivors on screen, but all you really need to know is that the Dark Continent is home to amazing beneficial resources like miracle herbs, plants which can extend lifespans, and efficient energy solutions. These resources could tip the balance of power in the known world if one nation got access to them but not others. So imagine the UK finding an ore that produces endless electricity without any drawbacks during their trip to Mars and monopolizing it. Nations which rely on coal burning and nuclear energy to generate electricity would fall behind and have to kato to the UK if they wanted access to the electric ore. Trying to avoid this situation, the V5 are essentially telling Kaken, yeah, we'll help you get to Mars, just make sure to split the ore with us. That being said, past attempts to secure ore and other miraculous resources have had limited success at most and caused terrible harm at worst. For example, on Beyond's previous voyage, he went with a team who wanted to bring back a specimen of a unique plant. The team went off route, caught Zobe disease, and the plant specimen died, resulting in no overall gain and the introduction of deadly Zobe disease into the known world. The majority of expedition teams were wiped out, and any survivors from the five resource-focused trips were forced to bear their respective calamities as punishment when they returned. 
Interestingly, on his first trip to the Dark Continent, the late chairman Nedro went with only two friends, Zig Zoldik, Killua's great or great great grandfather, and Lynette Adobel, the oldest hunter alive, for the sole purpose of sightseeing, and all three returned without being forced to bring back a calamity. This is in line with the gatekeeper preferring sightseers like Nedro and his friends over those driven by greed to harvest resources like the five larger nation-sponsored expeditions. Jing concludes with TLDR, exploring the dark continent is super high risk but high return, asking the team if they still want to go. The team member who left after getting paid earlier returns, revealing he spent the money to save a hospital, taking care of his sick sister. He pledges loyalty to Jing, ready to lay down his life for the man on the dark continent. And Jing smiles, saying, well shucks, now he can't let the dude die. Jing goes on to reveal Journey to the New World, the book which taught us about the calamities, was written 300 years ago by a solo dark continent explorer. Originally a pair of books, the set detailed the author's travels in two volumes, one covering the east half of the shore and the other covering the west half. Interestingly, no one has ever found the West volume of the set, leading Jing to believe the author is still writing it while exploring the Dark Continent to this day. One of the team members gapes at the theory, almost considering it impossible as it implies the author is 300 plus years old, before remembering the miraculous herbs which exist on the Dark Continent could prolong lifespan. The mysterious author of the book, an ancestor of Jing and Gon, known only by the name Dawn Freaks. Chapter 345 Gon calls his dad Jing, asking for advice after noticing he can no longer see his aura or life energy. Jing assures him it's still there, Gon just has lost his ability to see it. At the end of the Chimera Ant arc, Gon offered all his life energy in return for the power to defeat his enemy and avenge a slain friend. Though he was expected to die, Kilwa's sister Nanika performed a miracle, healing his body. Jing tells him to be grateful he's alive at all, only suffering the loss of his Nen as the consequence of his reckless actions. After being advised to focus on what he can do as he is now, Gon returns to Whale Island where his journey began in the first volume of Hunter x Hunter, bringing his arc full circle. On Whale Island, Gon spends time with Aunt Mito, his mother figure, who asks if he wanted to explore the Dark Continent with Jing. Gon reflects maybe he would have wanted to go if he could still use Nen when he met his dad. Though, after meeting Jing, Gon realized his goal hadn't been to spend time with Jing, but merely to find him. After he accomplished that goal and the two talked on top of the World Tree at the end of the anime, Gon realized Jing was more like an uncle than a dad. Just like Jing wasn't cut out to be a dad, Gon wonders if maybe he wasn't cut out to be a son. Which... Let me just play that Leorio punching clip again. Yeah, that's better. Aunt Mito smiles, happy to be able to spend time with Gon again, and presents the boy with a massive stack of paperwork which he'd neglected during his adventures. Back in Beyond's hideout, the team tells Jing until everyone accepts him as number two, none of them would follow his orders to avoid infighting. They try to describe themselves as novices, but Jing immediately rebuffs the lie, confident they're all experts. He goes on to hypothesize all Beyond's expedition team members have been preparing to accompany Beyond for years, some of Beyond's supporters even joining the Hunter Association to slowly influence policies favorable for Dark Continent exploration. Jing guesses they're all skilled and confident, stating money likely doesn't motivate most of them, even guessing correctly that the exploration team is larger than they're making it seem. Periston listens, quietly, realizing the two of them do think alike. He realizes he might grow to hate someone for the first time in his life. A sinister vibe frames his smile as he wonders what he'll want to do to someone he hates. Periston looks forward to their game. Jing goes on to guess there are about 200 Beyond supporters in the Hunter Association, with around 25 additional outside members forming the actual exploration team. He offers to pay all 225 plus of them, extending his deal even to those not going on the actual voyage itself. 
One of the team members does the math, realizing Jing must be stacked if he's casually throwing around billions just for the number two title, and in name only too. Elsewhere, in a nightclub, Prince Sarai Nick's henchman picks up two girls, bringing them to the prince's hotel. Greeting them in a richly decorated room, Sarai Nick smiles warmly, saying he enjoys inviting people over and conversing with all sorts so he doesn't lose touch. Cut to Sarai Nick in a bathtub, blood splattered all over the floor and the girl's hair in the drain. He complains to a henchman over the phone that the woman couldn't hold an educated conversation with him, comparing them to pigs and monkeys in a misogynistic rant. He describes himself as an art buff, just the art he collects is made with human body parts. His favorite being art made by forcing youths with futures into extreme situations. If you see where this is going, gold star, or should I say, scarlet star? Interestingly, Saranik lists knowing the capital of Kakin, the ruling party, and the king's name as bare minimums for human beings, although these are very specific and quite self-centered details. He demands two more females be brought to him, and this is our first introduction to the monster Karapika will have to defeat to fulfill his goal. Sarainik is also the first of three separate and menacing Antichrist figures who will wreak havoc on the Black Whale. Three seems a little extreme, but they all are pretty unique and interesting. The V5 ordered Cheadle to have Beyond sign a contract threatening her with consequences if the Zodiacs allow Beyond to escape and claim ownership of any discovery on the Dark Continent. Back in his containment cell, Cheadle hands Beyond the contract, telling him he'll be under 24-hour surveillance during the voyage and have to wear an ankle monitor. His communications will be monitored, he's forbidden from resisting the association, and anything he discovers will belong to the B6. Beyond signs the contract and balances the pen upright on the page with a grin. Beyond says they've gained permission for the voyage, and now only three things remain. Qualifications, the means, and a contract. It's unclear what he means exactly because he just signed a contract, but here are my interpretations. 1. Qualifications Beyond is referring to the screening and recruitment of additional association members for the voyage through the Hunter exam. 2. The means The means of travel likely refers to the Black Whale 1 ship. 3. A contract Likely before the ship can touch down on the Dark Continent soil, they'll have to negotiate a contract with the gatekeeper for a guide. Mizaistam asks what Karapika will do after he gets the eyes back, and Karapika answers he just wants his brethren back, adding he'll yield to most demands. There are two interpretations of this last line. One, Karapika is open to doing anything after he's done retrieving the eyes, or two, he's dodging the question by saying he's open to doing almost anything to retrieve the eyes from Saridnik. I'd consider the latter more likely. Mizaistam asks what Karapika plans to do if Saridnik refuses to yield the eyes, and Karapika reveals he hasn't had to kill any eye owners yet, though implying threats or rough coercion were used. Chapter 346 Welcoming Leorio and Karapika after they arrive at Hunter Association headquarters, the Zodiacs hold a strategy meeting. Cheadle goes over the information they know, stating the Zodiac's mission is to overcome at least one danger and return with something beneficial for mankind. Note that Cheadle's interpretation of Nedro's request is extremely conservative slash safe and absolutely doesn't match Periston's interpretation at all. I honestly doubt most of the more radical Zodiacs agree with her assessment but use it more as the bare minimum goal of their trip. Cheadle moves on to discussing their job of babysitting Beyond. She debates whether the Zodiacs should take Beyond all the way or drop him off with the normies on the uninhabited island or the moon. It's honestly pretty hilarious that Cheadle thinks they can choose whether or not to take Beyond to the Dark Continent, 
Um, like this man has been preparing for over 50 years for his dad to kick it so he can go again. He'd probably swim there freestyle through the ocean if that's what it took. There is, there's no stopping him, honestly. He's, he's gonna, he's gonna make it there. Karapika raises his hand, asking how the Zodiacs plan to handle beyond supporters in the association itself, asking if the Zodiacs know how many there are, showing his strategic intelligence immediately. Karapika guesses beyond plan to involve the Hunter Association in his trip from the beginning, which is why he turned himself in. As Beyond is so confident in his escape, Karapika guesses he must have a competent right-hand man and a large base of supporters in the association. Cheadle surmises Beyond's right-hand man is Pariston, before shooting Mizaistom a meaningful look. Understanding, Mizaistom takes Karapika out into the hallway away from the others to confirm his theory there's a traitor on Beyond's side among the Zodiacs. Karapika asks how it's possible since the late Netero picked the Zodiacs himself, Mazaistam describes the former chairman as crazy, stubborn, and prone to doing what he thought would be fun, smiling a bit at the memory. Essentially, even knowing the specific Zodiac was a spy, Netero likely appointed them anyways for fun. Back together, the Zodiacs outline their basic duties for the voyage with Leorio, the new Boar Zodiac, declaring he'll support Cheadle's medical team, and Karapika, the new rat zodiac, offering to act as an informant due to his ties to the criminal underworld. The way your heart drops after reading Karapika has become the Nestrad mafia family's boss, by the way, is just... Oof. Cheadle then announces they'll be recruiting additional voyage personnel through the hunter exam, just like Jing, Pariston, and beyond guests before finishing her speech by asking everyone to work together to make their mission a success. Time for a crash course in Nen, or the superpowers of the Hunter Hunter universe. Nen is aura control. Aura is life energy. Everyone has life energy, but not everyone can control it. So everyone has the potential to learn aura control, or Nen. Think of aura as passive energy radiation. It's like how human bodies produce heat as a byproduct of cellular processes. People subconsciously produce aura or heat by just being alive. And then users can control that life energy, that heat, and concentrate it to do things. And then users can sense the aura of other living things and even suppress their own aura to stay off the radar of other Nen users. More skilled life energy control can manifest as powers fitting for each individual's personality, beliefs, and motives. As life energy manipulation or NEN is tied to an individual's willpower, strong beliefs and motivations can influence the abilities someone develops. For example, with the goal of revenge in mind, Karapika developed the NEN ability Chain Jail, which specifically targets spiders, members of the troop that killed his clan. As aura is life energy, each person has a limited amount of it available to them, and pushing their abilities too far can burn up their lifespan, decreasing the years they have left. Aside from training to improve control of aura and use it in a more effective manner, there are two ways to increase power. The first, to be reckless and burn through it as stated earlier, to literally use your own life as fuel to make the Nen fire bigger. The second, and more common, is to place restrictions on an ability. Often strong abilities in the series can have two, even three or more conditions which must be met before a Nen ability activates. These limitations mean the resulting effect is more potent. For example, the condition on Karapika's chain jail is the target must be a spider. The ability is so strong and unbreakable because there are only 12 spiders in the world, meaning his chain jail ability doesn't work on 99.9% .9 of people. Prolo's ability to steal another's Nen ability has an entire list of conditions he must meet. Although Krolo's ability is crazy strong for battles where he has time to plan ahead, the long list of conditions makes it difficult to activate during spur-of-the-moment battles. Due to the nature of Aura being life energy and everyone having a relatively even playing field, information and tactics are critical to Nen battles. 
in a Nen battle, a weaker Nen user can still come out on top if they manage to avoid fulfilling the stronger user's Nen activation conditions. This renders intelligence and intel just as valuable, if not more so, than strength. Unlike other shonen, the protagonist can't just whip out a spirit ball out of nowhere to defeat the big bad, at least not without paying an exorbitant price. Nen explanations can get super technical, but I've gotta be honest, my eyes glaze over every time Wing starts defining them in the show, so for these videos, I'll try to keep everything as basic as possible. Long story short, Nen is life energy control. Back to the chapter. One month later in Beyond Space, Jing impresses the team with his masterful control of life energy by shaping his into precise little aura shapes and moving them around, around on his hands. Another member, Curly, challenges Jing to an ancient language contest, and when Jing trounces him, he admits defeat, accepting the money and Jing is number two. Harrison informs Jing the team members he sent to infiltrate the Hunter Association failed due to the new rat zodiac, Karapaga. Muhair, one of the team members sent to infiltrate, says it seemed as if Karapaka could read minds. He says if they'd been told Beyond's escape plan, the zodiacs might have discovered it. Harrison laughs with his hands behind his back, saying the team doesn't have a plan to free Beyond. Declaring Beyond will escape on his own and the team will rendezvous with him on the Dark Continent. Spotting Jing, Muhair picks a fight with him, telling him to get out. Jing stands his ground, saying he's supporting Beyond rather than the Hunter Association because he wants freedom to explore once they land. He doesn't want to be tied up with the Association's politics and limitations. The difference between Beyond and Jing is that for Beyond, the adventure continues until he brings back the fruits of his voyage. Jing implying that, unlike Beyond, he doesn't care about the return trip or gathering resources. He'd probably be happy to live the rest of his life on the Dark Continent, honestly, just exploring and wandering. Jing tells Muhair his goal is to help Beyond, but deter Periston, who wants to destroy while calling it love. He asks if Muhair understands, and Muhair responds he can't, but Periston is giving him the death stare during this conversation, so it's possible Muhair does understand Jing's point, perhaps he even agrees with it. Another team member calms everyone down, and Muhair sees the influence Jing has had on the team, sees how he's won over a bunch of them in the past month of hanging around the base. Just then, some goons confront Jing and Periston, giving them two options. One, Periston leaves, or two, Jing leaves. Jing says the third option is that the goons leave, and Periston says the fourth option is the goons die. Chapter 347 The goons then pull out firearms, shouting the fifth option is both the Jing and Periston die before opening fire. Jing and Periston escape into the basement with Periston asking if they should fight. Jing says alright and Periston seems surprised Jing seems willing to let him witness his men as the information would give him an advantage if the two were ever to battle. Jing says it's no problem before punching the ground in a recreation of Leorio's punching move from the election arc. Periston wonders if Jing can copy abilities, but Jing tells him learning punching abilities he's been hit with is just a physical talent he has as a fighter. It has nothing to do with Nen. Jing uses another Leorio learned ability to take out the remaining goons. After a while of silence, Periston guesses the goons gave up and Jing sighs, revealing he knew Periston had hired the goons to rile Jing up to gather intel on his abilities. Jing realized this when the goons didn't present the option of both Periston and Jing leaving. Essentially, while this would have been the ideal solution for Beyond's team, if both the ex-Zodiacs left um, because they don't super trust them, Jing may have actually chosen that option if it was offered as it would have hindered Periston's plans, and Periston didn't want Jing to actually leave, so he didn't include it in the script as an option. Jing fought the goons anyways out of pity. They had to follow Periston's weak script, telling the man if he wants to see Jing's actual abilities, he'll have to get his hands dirty and fight himself. Jing walks back upstairs, leaving Periston standing there with hatred bubbling up in his dark eyes. Upstairs, Jing scolds Muhair for his bad acting in Periston's play and Muhair sighs, dropping the angry man act. 
Jane worries the men under Muhair's command are too weak to face the Dark Continent after seeing the goons fight, but Muhair assures him the goons are just coming to scout and provide backup. The main firepower of Beyond's exploration team is a massive robotic creature named Gollum, who shows Jing their skills by conjuring heavy firearms with Nen. As Muhair leads the combatant team members, Jing asks if he'll convince his subordinates to accept his money deal. Muhair says money is actually the reason why he can't accept Jing as number two. As mercenaries, a lot of Muhair's people and clients value trust, so the idea of switching sides for money is a no-go. They can't accept because it goes against their values and could smear their reputation. Jing apologizes for bringing up the offer of money in the first place. He only did it because he was put on the spot to come up with a benefit he'd bring as number two. After he offered to double everyone's pay, however, he realized no one would be swayed by greed anyways and would only accept the offer if they accepted him as number two already, so it turned out to be fine. Since he can't take back his offer, however, he proposes depositing the mercenaries' shares into a charity which helps the families of mercenaries who die in battle. The way the charity, the Norwell Fund, works is only mercenaries can contribute to it. If Jing donates to the Norwell Fund, he'll be considered a mercenary. Muhair is shocked, warning Jing if he becomes a mercenary, he'll have to take orders from higher-ups in the mercenary chain. Jing says it's fine because it's a solution which solves the money problem, as higher-up mercenaries have joint management of the charity's money, so there won't be any rumors Muhair's crew defected for selfish money-related reasons. I think this got confusing real quick and it took me a while to understand what is even happening with this, so let me just recap the play-by-play -play of Jing's first move real quick. Basically, Jing stated he wanted to be number two, but in name only. Beyond's team asked what he could bring to the table. Jing said money on the spot because it's the first thing he thought of and he wanted to sound cool. Jing offering money to these professionals is like holding up a plate of cookies and saying, if you accept me as number two, I'll give you a cookie. Obviously, no one would accept him because of the cookie, but as he hung out with the team and impressed them through his Dark Continent knowledge, Nen control, and language skills, more members took a cookie from the plate showing that they accepted him. Muhair, however, went, dude, WTF, you're insulting us by bribing us with sweets. It's going to make my team look unprofessional if we take a cookie because other mercenaries will gossip we switch sides for a cookie even if it's not true and we can't risk that. Jing can't take his cookie offer back because some of the team already took some from the plate but he recognizes Muhair's situation so he proposes delivering Muhair's mercenaries share of the cookies to a low income daycare or charity to feed hungry kids. Muhair says Jing can't pass the locked gates to enter the daycare to deliver the cookies unless he has a special mercenary badge and to get one he'd have to sign a contract to volunteer at the place or follow orders when asked. Jing says it's fine and signs up for the mercenary badge and delivers the share of the cookies. Once the cookies are delivered, all daycare slash mercenary organizers can distribute them and see Muhair's team isn't benefiting personally from the cookies. Meaning when Muhair's team accepts Jing as number two, there won't be any rumors it was because they were swayed by wanting to eat cookies and could be swayed to backstab future employers by a mere offer of sweets or money. Jing tells the team he didn't even have a strategy. He just came initially to lodge a complaint that Beyond was messing up his own Dark Continent plans by stirring up world powers, but once he arrived at the base, he surprised himself by saying, let me join. When asked why they should accept him, Jing tried to be cool by offering money or cookies when he could have just said, I'm knowledgeable and I want to explore like beyond or something. Muhair looks at him as if asking, are you dumb? Since Jing made the situation more complicated than it needed to be by not explaining himself once the money thing got out of hand. Jing restates he wants to hinder Paris's schemes and help beyond. Muhair sighs, accepting Jing as number two, but reminding him since he donated to the charity and earned himself a shiny new mercenary badge, he has to follow Muhair, the mercenary leader's orders on the battlefield. Jing replies with a sharp salute and sir yes sir, and Muhair sighs again. Someone help this man honestly, dealing with both Periston and Jing's scheming in one day seems, seems so exhausting. 
Periston returns, informing Jing that everyone else on the team accepted him as number two and congratulating him on his first move. Jing says the title is in name only and Periston can keep leading, but Periston actually refuses, handing the reins over to Jing, who grins, declaring he won't hold back. It's possible to read this as Periston turning down the challenge of playing and managing the expedition team at the same time, but I actually prefer the interpretation he wants to see how Jing will arrange the game board, as previously Jing just moved the pieces on the board that Periston set up. Further thoughts. Periston. Fun fact, Periston's full name is actually an anagram of Paris Hilton, which is hilarious. Togashi has an amusing naming convention where he literally just takes random words and mixes up letters. For example, the Kaken Empire is on the ASEAN continent, which is clearly just Asia. And there's even a character with the last name Lucifer, which is literally just Lucifer. Anyways, pretty boy with a heart of mold, Periston. We first meet Periston during the election arc where he won quite easily through manipulation and tactics. During the final vote, his intelligence clearly showed when his prediction gone would arrive at the election hall came true despite Periston having no real way to know this would happen. A lot of his motivations are difficult to understand, but at the very least, he wants the Hunter exam to be more rigorous and the Hunter Association to be more challenging. He tells Cheadle to reform the Association's code of laws and the Hunter exam when he gives the chairman position over to her, so like, he warns Cheadle not to let the Association become boring, as if that's the worst possible outcome. We find out he wants to play a game with 5,000 deadly mutant ants, but he also cares about the Hunter Association in a way. At the end of the election arc, he makes it seem as if he wants to step away from messing with the association and find fun elsewhere, but here we are just a couple chapters later with the association back in his sights again, as if he can't quite bring himself to let it go. It's almost like an obsessive love. I like how Jing doesn't outright deny Periston's theology of love, because it does hold true to some extent. It's common for parents to push their children out of their comfort zone for their own good. It's also common to want to smother a loved one and never let them go. Periston just takes it to an extreme level. He doesn't know the meaning of the word filter, and no one really cares enough to teach him. His relationship with Netero grounded him to some extent, but when Netero died, that tether vanished. I'm slowly realizing more and more, Nedro really was a necessary anchor for balance and order in the Hunter x Hunter universe. It took a while to see the fallout, but it's beginning to affect the world in major ways. Nedro's very existence kept Beyond and other potential Dark Continent explorers at bay. When chaotic elements got too crazy like the Chimera Ant King, he was there to handle them and help balance the scale back toward order. After Nedro died, all the chaotic elements he was keeping in balance were set free and started sliding toward entropy again. Periston is a great example of this. After losing his playmate with Netero's death, Periston challenged the Zodiacs to try to beat him during the election arc. The game was the election and the prize everyone raced for was being elected the new chairman of the Hunter Association. Though the Zodiacs put up a slight struggle, Jing and Cheadle being serviceable obstacles. In the end, Periston won just as he predicted. This victory was likely a disappointment to him, indicating the Zodiacs weren't interesting playmates. Without a care, Periston resigned immediately, tossing Cheadle his prize of the chairman's seat as if it was worthless to him. And now, without Netero to stop him, Periston's whipping out the casual 5,000 Chimera Ants setting up his next game on a grander scale. In his conversation with Muhair, Jing belittles Periston's love as just a cover-up for his desire to destroy, but I think Periston does see his destruction as genuine love. It's fun to imagine Jing purposefully misinterpreted it here, even if he actually does understand it as well, just to mess with Periston or even to mirror Muhair's thoughts as he was working on winning Muhair over at the time in that conversation. Next up, Jing. Jing is not inherently a good person. 
He's he's a terrible dad. Making his own kid question whether he was a good son is awful. That's that's a new level of deadbeat. Every viewer cheered with the audience when Leorio punched him during the election arc and called him out for not even visiting his dying son in the hospital. Jing's not perfect in his game with Periston either. If he just killed Periston and all of Periston's allies, or at least the ones in charge of the Chimera Ants, he would ensure the world's safety. But that's not his goal. He doesn't want to save the world. He doesn't care. He just wants to play a game as well, to match wits with Periston. If the end goal was to stop Periston's ant plan, he could probably do so, even if he had to fight 5,000 Chimera Ants barehanded. But Jing wants to beat Periston at his own game. He wants to play. This could be fine if all goes well, but it could also be disastrous. Worst case scenario, it would be like in Dragon Ball when Vegeta didn't go all out on Cell, and then Cell evolved into an unbeatable monster. That being said, it's hard not to cheer for Jing here as Periston is just so punchable. In the fan translation, Periston shows more surprise at Jing knowing about the ant soldiers as it's not public knowledge. We find out that Jing found out about the ants through his pilot friends telling him. This information probably casually given to him over, over a chill lunch. I love the mental image of Jing and some pilot having sandwiches and crisps and the dude just dropping the info casually as they catch up after not seeing each other for a while. A massive contrast to how Periston has to manipulate and lie and pay for each and every piece of information he gathers because Periston doesn't have many, if any, genuine friends. Just the contrast is fantastic. Jing naturally fits into Beyond's team as well. While Periston barely speaks to most members, Jing's over here playing aura shaping challenges, Mario Kart, Hurley's language games. He steps into each member's arena, their game boards, and plays in a way which garners him respect. Muhair's mercenary situation was definitely a complicated scenario, and Jing was at some fault for it, but he immediately apologized, going so far as to become a mercenary to resolve the issue in a satisfactory way, which gained him Muhair's respect. Jing's not a perfect dude at all, but when standing next to Periston, he honestly looks like a saint. And also, Periston won the last game by coming in first in the Zodiac election race, so this round, it'd be more interesting if Jing won. Cheadle. Cheadle is so clearly out of her depth trying to fill Nedro's shoes that it's honestly kind of depressing. It's like watching a dog trying to put on a dress shirt and type emails on a keyboard with paws to do their dead owner's office job. I actually saw a headcanon the other day that Cheadle was the one who Nedro trusted to sew the miniature rose bomb inside his chest and honestly, yeah, probably, and also, ouch. Recently rewatched Periston's resignation scene as well and finally understood why Cheadle was so mad at him throughout it even after he admitted to missing Nedro. Likely she understood Periston was grieving in his own weird way, but she was angry at him for acting out, stirring up trouble and abandoning the rest of the Zodiacs. She was essentially saying all these Zodiacs Miss Nedero asking Periston, what gives you the right to act out like this when we're all holding it together? Ooh. Cheadle and Periston embody two different forms of love which shows in their attitude toward the Hunter Association, Nedero's organization. Cheadle's steadfast loyalty versus Periston's obsessive destruction. With having to manage the other chaotic Zodiac members, the entire Hunter Association, V5's orders, and beyond on top of all her medical duties, Cheadle has a lot on her plate for the voyage, and I hope, I hope we get to see her snap. Get to see her whip out a gun and go, I'm a healer, but... Karapika. As Nen abilities reflect their users' personalities, what does it say that Karapika's Nen abilities manifest as chains wrapping around his hand and heart? What does it say that three of his abilities cost lifespan to use, and one of them stakes his literal life? Karapaka is a crushing example of the concept of self-aware self-destruction. 
He's an extremely intelligent character who knows his friends are good for him, which is why he distances himself. He knows his anger and need for revenge will fade with time, which is why he's so urgently searching for the eyes. Once he's recovered all the eyes, he wants to begin living, but he's been looking backward in time so long he can no longer see a future for himself. Honestly, what do you even say to a person like Karapika? Revenge is bad? He already knows. Being around friends will help? He already knows. Things will heal with time? He already knows. Rather than helping, his awareness is why he pushes himself so hard. That's the most tragic part of it, I think. That he is lucid. He is aware of how his past is chaining him down, destroying his future. Yet he feels compelled to walk the path of darkness that's forcing him to give up pieces of himself to accomplish his goal. By the time he finds closure and reconciles with the past, will he have any more future left to live? Questions and theories. There are quite a few of them this time, so let's just get right into it. What does Periston plan to do with the 5,000 Chimera Ants? Periston's 5,000 Chimera Ants are an interesting and potentially deadly chess piece to consider. When and how it'll be deployed on the board is yet unknown, but seeing as each ant is a Nen user, a soldier with superpowers, any possibility could have deadly repercussions. Jing hypothesizes Periston will either release the ants on the world or fill the Hunter Association with them. The first option would likely result in civilian casualties and mass chaos, while the latter could set the stage for destroying the Hunter Association from the inside out. To be honest, I I have no clue. Periston already beat the Zodiacs during the election arc, and they don't seem that fun to mess with again. Periston does have an obsession with the Hunter Association because Netero used to lead it, but 5,000 5, ants is a lot to use if he just wants to force Cheadle to make the entrance exam tougher or change some laws. My most reasonable guess is Periston could use the Chimera ants to break into the bunker and set the five calamities free, forcing the entire world to grow to survive. I'm, I'm just caught up on the specific and massive number. He wouldn't need all 5,000 to break into the bunker or force Cheadle to reform bylaws. Why 5,000 ants unless Periston is going to do something on a grand scale with them? To be honest, I, I hope Periston doesn't release the ants on the world because after the lengthy Chimera ant arc, I'm kind of tired of seeing them. I don't know if I could handle Chimera ant arc 2 electric boogaloo. Is Sheila Periston? Due to similarities between Sheila and Periston's designs and general shadiness, some believe the two could be one and the same. In Karapika's memories, Sheila wears a headband with two circular ears, which could be interpreted as panda or rat ears. During the election arc, we learned the reason the zodiacs look so much like their animal motifs is because many purposefully altered their styles to align with Netero's titles for them. It's implied that some of them even got plastic surgery out of a deep loyalty to Netero, and that's honestly so sweet and sad. Not all the Zodiacs did this though. Notably, Jing and Periston don't have animal-inspired wardrobes or features. Although Periston was the rat Zodiac, he, uh, he didn't wear ears. I guess you could say he removed them. He removed the ears to mess with Netero, but uh, a little far-fetched. The main similarity is just the eyes, and while the similarity is striking, I wouldn't say it's conclusive. Personality-wise, the two are both mysterious and a little shady, Periston being hard to read and Sheila mysteriously appearing in the forest before leaving, right before the massacre occurred. While Sheila asking the boys not to tell the elders of her presence and re-injuring her leg a bunch is strange, it could be explained by her wariness and survival instincts kicking in. Being injured in the middle of nowhere, she would be defenseless if the village adults ordered her execution for stumbling upon their secret village. 
It's natural she'd lie about how healed her leg was to give her an advantage if she needed it. Also about the leg thing, we do learn that Sheila has had the bad habit of falling due to reading while walking since she was a child later, so that's another possibility. To be honest, I prefer the idea that Pariston was just born bizarre and malicious. Having a tragic backstory as an orphan of Meteor City doesn't detract from my theories about Sheila's role in the Kurta clan massacre, but it does make Pariston less scary, which I dislike. Difficult to understand antagonists are fun because it's scary not being able to wrap your head entirely around their motives, and I don't want to lose that with Pariston. How many survivors return from the Dark Continent? 29? 28? 1? In earlier chapters, Steiner said there were 28 survivors of the V5's unofficially sanctioned resource securing trips, and of those 28, only Beyond is still alive today and mentally sound enough to live in society. But later we learn there are a couple more survivors, like Steiner's boss in the Red Tape Agency who survived the Dark Continent and seems fine. So what's up with that? Well, the general gist is, 300 years ago, the book Journey to the New World, East Edition, was published. Although the public considered it fiction, it inspired some brave people to explore. After learning of the dangerous entities which live there, five major world powers, the V5, signed a legal treaty banning Dark Continent trips 200 years ago. The treaty stopped most trips for a while before the member countries of the V5 realized Hey, this treaty is literally just a piece of paper and it can't stop me. So the individual countries started sponsoring unofficial exploration trips under the table anyways. In total, they sent 149 exploration groups with only five trips returning at all, suffering serious casualties and each of the five trips harboring a calamity. The calamity bestowed upon them by the Gatekeeper's Guide as a warning about coming to the Dark Continent for selfish reasons like resource gathering. Of these country-sponsored trips, 28 people are said to have returned, with Beyond being labeled as the only current survivor. Interestingly, by adding up the numbers, Jing tells us survived in each mission, and we get 29? One off? And we know the Zobe infected explorer is still alive? Just, um, he's not okay, but he's still alive. So I'm guessing the reason for this disparity is Steiner just doesn't count the Zobe victim as a survivor. Steiner went, um, that thing's not human anymore, which I guess I can't blame him. On top of the country sponsored under the table, 149 unofficial explorations, though, some individuals conducted their own own undocumented explorations. The Red Tape Agency and V5 aren't aware of these individual explorations, which is why the survivors aren't counted in Steiner's figures. Zig Zoldick, Linnea Dobel, and Steiner's boss are Dark Continent survivors, and they are still alive today. There are likely more, honestly, out in the world. Interestingly, these smaller scale adventure driven expeditions didn't seem to incur the wrath of the gatekeeper and didn't introduce further large scale calamities. Perhaps they did bring back things like the chimera ants, the kurda, the sonata of darkness, or other small scale dangers, or perhaps they even brought back beneficial discoveries, we just don't know. Will this voyage bring back a sixth calamity? With Beyond's goals amended in these chapters with the desire to bring back his finds on the return voyage, and Jing knowing he wants to take an untraveled path again, it's definitely possible. It's amusing to note the reason the crew caught Zobe disease on his first voyage was because Beyond took an uncharted route, and not having learned that lesson, Beyond wants to do it again. I'm sure he finds it exciting, but... He definitely disregards the well-being of others in pursuit of his dreams. Would Jing have taken Gon if he could still use Nen? If Gon could have still used Nen, I consider it possible Jing would have taken him along, not as a son, but as a co-worker. And yeah, just some depressing realizations all around for Gon. 
but he has a future ahead of him and having achieved his goal, I'm sure he'll discover a new dream to stride for soon enough. Does Periston have an escape plan for Beyond? Will Beyond break free during the voyage? In his first interrogation with the Zodiacs, Beyond made the prediction he would be released. Cheadle pointedly declared he would not be released before the voyage, but Beyond could have been referring to the fact he'll likely be released during the voyage. Though I'm sure he could free himself no sweat, Beyond is a charismatic captain with a lot of supporters. I'd love to see his subordinates free him, as it would display their competence and his belief in their skills. Periston denies having a plan, stating Beyond will break free himself and meet them on the Dark Continent, but I don't believe him. In addition to Periston speaking with his hands behind his back in the scene, a pose used to symbolize deceit on the cover of this specific volume on screen right here, where both Zodiac traders have their hands behind their backs. Um, earlier, one of Beyond's team members referred to a plan. Also, Periston is a scheming liar, so I'm sure at the very least he has a couple rough ideas, and more likely, he's probably formulated one or two complex ideas. If Periston manages to jailbreak Beyond during the voyage, it could result in political chaos. The Hunter Association, Zodiacs, Jang, Beyond, and Beyond's team all in the same enclosed space. A game board with so many interesting pieces must sound, must sound awfully appealing to Periston. What was the Kurta clan's past? We learn in Karapika's backstory that the Kurta have an inherent ability to trade off rationality for a strength boost when their eyes turn red. Karapika uses this natural trait of his to become a master of several different Nen abilities and even change his fighting style when his eyes are scarlet. The inherent talent of the Kurta is unique and extremely powerful, leading many readers to hypothesize the Kurta originated from the Dark Continent. Aside from their supernatural affinity for Nen, and the label on the chief's eyedrop bottle looking suspiciously similar to the gatekeeper's gate. My favorite supporting evidence for the theory is the red eyes are the devil's messenger's superstition. What does this phrase mean? Well, what if it implies the idea when the Kurta arrived in the known world, their appearance was followed shortly by one or more dark continent calamities or threats. Helpless against the calamities, everyday citizens may have taken out their anger and grief on the Kurta, a literal shooting of the messenger, if you will, even if the clan had nothing to do with the arrival of the calamities or threats themselves. Why didn't the Kurta chief wonder where Karapika got the Dino Hunter book from? Reading Volume Zero, this was one of my first questions, but I actually don't believe it's an important one in the long run. Perhaps after a hundred years of peace, the Kurta chief relaxed a bit, believing an adult brought Karapika the book from an outside world errand or something. The more important detail about the scene, I think, is that it means the book remained in the village after Karapika left, either with Pero or with the Elder. Why did Sheila give the boys her beloved book? Sheila's copy of Dino Hunter was clearly well-loved, with lots of page markers in it. Perhaps she was going to give up becoming a hunter after suffering in the woods, but after meeting the boys and seeing their fascination and dreams, she resolved to chase her own dreams again because of them. If the massacre didn't happen, I'd love to imagine Sheila and Karapaka crossing paths again after they both become pro-hunters one day. Although, the mental image of Sheila and Karapika crossing paths on the Black Whale one and Sheila apologizing to him profusely while Karapika looks exhausted with life and dead inside isn't that bad of a mental image either. <sighs> I actually hope someone draws or writes that scene someday. Another theory is just that Sheila knew that she could just go buy another copy of Dino Hunter later when she got back and wanted to give the boy something. What did Dino Hunter teach Karapika? The book which Sheila gifted Karapika, the book which inspired his dreams of exploring the outside world. Just what did Karapika take away from reading it every day for a year? 
In Karapika's backstory, as a kid, he quotes the book twice. The book taught him, quote, to overcome obstacles, to live the best you can, end quote. And, quote, there are always people willing to help no matter what. I am a massive proponent of the idea that the most important things in life are lessons children can understand. The lessons Karapika learned from Dino Hunter are lessons he learned when he was full of life, back before losing himself and his dreams. They are the exact two lessons he needs to internalize again. To overcome obstacles, to live the best you can. The book doesn't tell him he needs to be happy, just to live, just to do the best he can. There are always people willing to help no matter what. Karapika isolates himself, and on the boat, it'll feel like the entire world is against him. But even without Gon, Kilua, Leorio, there are people who rely on him and that he can rely on in return. No matter where he goes, he meets good people who are willing to help if he'll let them. If he can relearn these two simple lessons, I think he'll be okay. Whether it's possible, however, we can only hope. Themes. One of the major themes of Hunter Hunter is connections both breaking and healing people. During the Chimera Ant arc, Gon's connection with Kite is what drove him to recklessly sacrifice his Nen in order to pursue revenge. In the darkest moment of his life, it's what landed him in the hospital as a horrific shriveled husk. Then his connection with Kiwa healed him through Nanika's powers. In the same manner, Karapika's connection with his clan is what shattered his future. His lingering love and sense of duty to his brethren have led him down a self-destructive path and caused him great pain. Then in York New, after the spiders were reported dead and he felt lost, Gon, Kilua, and Leorio, his friends, invited him to a picnic where they made him smile with their shenanigans. I consider this smile, in the middle of York New, one of his last true smiles of the series. He was glad the spiders were dead, but more than that, he was glad he didn't have to kill them. I treasure this smile because it's the last time I felt Karapika was truly at peace. Once he found out the spiders were still alive, and even worse, after he found out that they were human, that they treasured their friends just like him, it was over. It was over. After his realization, even knowing the remaining spiders were still out there, Karapika notably drops his quest for revenge at the end of York New, instead focusing on the goal of recovering the eyes. If Karapika meets the spiders again and reignites his need for revenge, God forbid if he actually kills one, I, I think it would break him. In the next chapters, however, Karapika will make a new connection. One which has the potential to help him heal. Vengeance consuming identity is another fascinating theme of Karapika's story. In order to avenge his clan, Karapika molded his Nen ability to resemble chains. Chain Jail, in particular, an ability solely created to restrain spiders. At the end of York New, when Karapika loses the vengeance which has been fueling him for the past five years of his life, he falls ill for several days, after which he fills the void where vengeance once burned with a more somber fuel source, a goal to recover all the Kurta eyes. Catching up with him again after he's made progress in this goal, we learn each step on the path has cost Karapika dearly. He's given up his friends and connections, isolating himself and becoming a mafia family boss just to better track down eyes on the black market. He's thrown away his morals to blackmail and threaten eye owners. He's even abandoned the unique Kurta traditional clothing, which was so characteristic of his early appearances. Connections, morals, culture. Without those, what even is a person? Karapika is in the process of literally losing pieces of his identity throwing away his dreams and values to pursue one goal which doesn't even seem to bring him happiness. Is Karapika recovering the Kurta eyes because he feels doing so will truly put his brethren to rest, 
Or is he doing it because he needs a goal to keep him going? At this point, it really seems it's tipping into more of the latter. When Mizaistan visits to recruit him, we see Karapika for the first time since York knew as he steps into the room. The figure he cuts in his all-black suit eerily resembles young Krolos after the spider threw away his morals to pursue a path of darkness to avenge the murder of his friend Sarasa. Machi even asking, is that Krolo? Not recognizing the person her childhood friend had become. Krolo and Karapika are enemies. Krolo being the spider who led the Kurta clan massacre, but it's horrifying to realize the two are growing more and more similar. During the voyage, Karapika will reveal his new ability, Stealth Dolphin, to us for the first time, which allows him to steal another person's Nen ability and use it once in exchange for chunks of his lifespan. We'll get more in depth into the details later when Karapika uses his abilities on the voyage, but at the end of the day, Stealth Dolphin is Karapika giving up a piece of himself to try on someone else's identity. The first comparison which jumps to mind immediately is Krolo's Nen ability, Bandit Secret, which allows the antagonist to steal others' Nen abilities, store them in his book, and use them later. Krolo threw away his own identity to achieve revenge, achieved that revenge, and now walks through life like an empty husk of a person, conflating his identity with the identities of others his Nen ability reflecting his blank slate personality. Like Bandit's Secret, Krolo is an empty book, searching for meaning and identity. I don't think it's any coincidence Karapika, who's following a parallel path in life to him, has developed an ability-stealing power, which is like an infant version of Bandit's Secret. Karapika and Krolo are often seen as opposing forces, but perhaps it's more fitting to see Krolo as a future Karapika. A warning to the identityless wanderer Karapika could become if he lets his revenge reignite and consume all he has left. On that lovely note, we've reached the end of the video. Some brain exploding, brain melting, 40 chess plays in this chunk of chapters. Luckily, we won't be seeing Jing and Periston again unless Togashi releases new chapters, so we can set their game board aside for now and get ready to meet the Succession War or Death Game participants in the next chapters. I can't wait to introduce them to you. Thanks for watching this long, long video. Sar, signing off.